Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. This is the RIA Edge podcast. I'm David Armstrong, the editor of wealthmanagement.com. Uh, as you know, this is the podcast that gives me the chance to speak to managers and principals of leading RIA firms that are growing in our estimation, as we say, by design and not by default. Not simply wafting up on the, the upwind of w AUM, but rather building sustainable growth for the future uh, and getting their insights on how they're doing it. So today I'm very pleased to speak with uh, Jeff Decker, who is the CEO of Wealth Enhancement Group. Uh, Jeff, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, David, hey, thanks thanks for having me. I, you're, you're talking about my favorite subject. Well, that's great. And and you know a lot about it. Uh, you've been at the Wealth Enhancement Group for about two decades now and definitely one of the firms most active in the M&A space. And and we want to talk about growth overall. So we'll we'll get to maybe some organic growth in a minute. But first of all, do you want to just give us a, a just a, a brief snapshot of where you're at right now with uh, Wealth Enhancement Group? I think uh, what, a little over $67 billion in AUM. Uh, where do you sit right now? And, and what does the view look like from where you are? Yeah, well, we we uh, overall we're we're right around eighty billion in in assets. We primarily, you know, that's RA assets. We do have some brokerage assets as well, and so we're we continue to grow obviously pretty aggressively. You know, as a firm, we're geographically we're really kind of East Coast, Upper Midwest, and West Coast, and and um, continue to to add into those areas. We're about you know we'll, we'll finish this year roughly about fifteen hundred partners within the firm. And, you know, it's, it's our whole, our whole drive is to think about, you know, you use a really critical word, which is sustainable, right? There's lots of firms that are growing, but the key question is, you know, is it, is it really sustainable? And, you know, that's, that's something that we think about as a sort of ingrained in our culture and we think about every day. Well, you've certainly been active in the space more than, you know, as, as one of the top firms, uh, you know, doing M&A. Uh, did you say close to 80 billion now in yeah. So that's that's amazing. I remember, boy, ten years ago, you couldn't find an RAA that was worth more than or that that had more than like five billion dollars, I and mean, they were rare. So this really demonstrates, I think, that you know the consolidation is happening and it's happening pretty quick uh, in this space. Do you uh, have any thoughts about you know in the, in the twenty some years you've been there, how your approach to M and A has changed? Uh, you do, but I don't more than several deals a year. Has has the approach changed at all? Are you, the firms that you're looking for, where where are you now in your acquisition strategy? Yeah, you know we we um you know what I would say let me let me, a couple things I would say you know twenty years I, I I would say you know I it's kind of hard to believe that it's been twenty years but I think over that time period we've really gone through different phases um, as a business right I mean we've always had this this desire to make sure that we have an organization that um, truly can have sustainable growth and. And so really for the first decade I was there, we, we really didn't do any acquisitions. Um, we grew, when I, when I came to the firm, it was about 600 million in, in AUM combined of, of our two sort of business lines. And, yeah, but over that time, we grew the business to, you know, roughly four to $5 billion in assets, really just purely organically. And, you know, I think that that, you know, for us, that's always been a cornerstone of our ability to be in the M&A market. You know, we never saw... You know, the question is, is M&A strategic or is it tactical, right? And we we didn't get into the M&A business saying, oh, that's our that's our one strategic pathway to grow. We looked at it and said, you know, we really have this this investment and engine that really drives organic growth. How can we expand the footprint? So therefore, sort of M&A became a little bit more of a, an extension of our overall strategy of growth as opposed to our defining strategy of the business, if, if that sort of makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in that time, I mean, and then in terms of how we've executed on that, you know, I would say that we're fairly dynamic. We, we want to make sure, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're finding, you know, great value for both us and our partner firm and that, that's coming in. And so, you know, I would say that we have shifted a number of times. We've seen, we continually look and, and you know, we look for what parts, you know, other segments in the space that have maybe aren't kind of being as aggressively valued as other areas. And then we look in that and then we look specifically for cultural fit and also sort of value proposition, meaning is their value proposition consistent with what we're offering um, within that? Because you know, if you get back to sustainable, I mean, there's, there's 51 key E bag, this is our estimate on it, but there are 51 key E backed platforms now in the space. 
And, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's not always easy to, to find, you know, reasonable value within that, right? We want to make sure it's great value for the partner firm coming in, but we also want to make sure it's good value for us too, so that we can, without doing that, we wouldn't have a sustainable solution. And so, you know, we, we, that's the dynamic component is we want to make sure we're finding the places within that where we're finding the firms that really match up culturally, match up from a value proposition, but then also match up into a value between the two of us that, that really makes sense on a sustainable basis. So yeah, I imagine the competitive landscape twenty years ago probably looked a little bit different. Well, twenty of you were you were doing uh, organic growth when you when you began the the uh, M and A route. The competitive landscape, I'm sure, looks a little bit different. Can you describe to us a little bit of what the M and A landscape looks like now here and just ending the first quarter of twenty twenty four? You know, have we turned a corner and in the pace and uh, high valuations and and the 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 rapid number of deals or uh, is it getting a little bit more competitive out there or is it mm, competition wise heating up still? You know, I, I think, well, the reality is for a process to be competitive, you only need two firms, right? And, and you, 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 you're off to the races, right? In terms of, you know, that, that can fuel a lot of great value for sellers. You know, when I think about today, there's, there's, you know, as I said, there's 51 PE backed firms and there are other firms that aren't PE backed that are also looking at merging with, with other RA firms along the way. You know, what I would say is say it, it's, it's an interesting crossroads, I think, right now, because a lot of those firms came in kind of in 2020, 21, <clears throat> interest rates were in a different place. And, but they came in with the, the fundamental, like their core strategy was we are going to acquire firms. And so they have to go acquire firms. And that's, you know, that's press, that's a pretty strong force against valuation. If you, if you were to look at the RA space. You know what I'd say. You know, I'll, I'll come into a more specific first quarter, but if you kind of look at it over the last two or three years, in a rising interest rate environment, you would expect multiples to contract, right? That would be that would be a normal, a normal and rational uh, expectation from just you know essentially the financial components of that. And in many spaces, you see that actually other sort of spaces in in across the industry, you'll see, or excuse me, across the sort of landscape of of the economy, you'll see that multiples have contracted a few turns. I would say in the, in our space, we've seen multiples stay steady and maybe even push up a little bit. So it's very much against the, against the sort of end, the financial engines mm -hmm. um, of this. It's really sort of counter to that, um, which is just a, you know, that's just a, a, a demonstration of the amount of capital, the amount of firms that are coming into the space. Within that, I think though, what you've seen is <laughs> Sellers uh, or buyers have been a little bit more aggressive about pushing some of the risk on the sellers. So yes, the multiples sustained at a time when it's actually retracting and brought more broadly in other spaces. So that's a positive for the for the sellers. In some cases, it's even up a little bit. Um, again, a positive for the sellers. What I would say is that the sellers though have had to sort of say, okay, but I'll take a little bit more risk in the future payments um, or the amount of the future payments um, that come out. If I if I kind of that and kind of bring it down more tightly, so what do I see happening today? I think there's a couple things we see. I would say um, it's sort of interesting. Sellers have gotten a little bit more patient. Um, I would say the pace of transactions, if you go back a few years, were were fairly rapid once sellers were engaged. You know, it was very crisp. Uh, but then you had a few. There were a few forces for that. Obviously, the there was the, sort of the threat of change in capital gains. Um, with the Biden administration coming in, um, that definitely fueled, you know, that fueled intense activity and hard deadlines. And then um, saw a little bit of it, you know, saying, you know, a threat of increasing inflation and interest rates sort of created this drive to to move transactions along pretty crisply. I think right now what I'd say we'd see is that we see sellers being, they're definitely engaged and they're definitely selling, but there's just, a, there's a little bit more of a calmness in the market, um, despite the competitive place. And I think, you know, some of that's coming from this place of, it doesn't hurt that, you know, the market's up dramatically, right? Um, that there's a forecast of rates coming down, right? I, I think people feel like we're in a, we're in a slightly stronger, more stable market conditions. Um, and so with that, we've seen, you know, we've seen transactions just kind of slow a little bit, right? It's not, it's not that they're not happening. It's not that they don't press forward, but the, this, I'd say the sense of urgency is it a little bit more of what I would call a calm pace. And I think that's, I think that's a net positive, you know, because that, that really allows both seller and buyer to really make sure. You know, the, the critical successor, right? Obviously, the seller receiving 
the chat, right? Or the proceeds, you know, that's, that's a critical component of it. But the real critical component at its core is, is this a good partnership, right? Is this, is this a coming together of the two firms that might, by coming together, they're better off together than separately. And, and ultimately the beneficiaries of that are the clients, you know, and, and obviously the employees of the firm that join. And so I think that, you know, having the pace, just kind of get back to what I call a more rational pace. You know, it's just, it's a net positive for all, you know, sort of all the stakeholders that are. Yeah, that's interesting. The, uh, you talk about the, a little bit of the risk being pushed onto the seller. I imagine the, the pool of sellers or acquirable firms, for lack of a better word, uh, is probably still large, but maybe smaller uh, than it was. A at the same time, you guys, we hear a lot about the, 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 I think, what is that? David Bo calls it the meta RAA. And I think you guys fall in that category, but a lot of your acquisitions are still in the, the, the relatively, I'd say not pejoratively, but relatively small, smaller space. I mean, you're still buying firms with $150 million in AUM or $200 million in AUM as well as larger firms. Uh, but I thought that the narrative was the larger you get, the larger the deals. Uh, you're still finding opportunities in that band of, of acquisition targets. Yes. Yeah. I, so, so I'd say a couple of things. One is, you know, the, the net number of RAAs is actually increasing year over year. Um, and so that's, you know, it's sort of interesting, right? And, and that's being sourced out of really an exodus out of what kind of, you know, basically the banks and warehouses is, is where that's coming from. And so, you know, so, so the, the category is actually expanding, right? Or, you know, the industry is really expanding in many ways <laughs> within, within sort of the potential targets within that. You know, we think about, so as we look at it, you know, we have a couple different approaches. So we have areas where we have a very strong centralized organic growth engine within our business. We invest a lot of our resources to that to support our advisors, right? And, and we have three we have three core channels that we pursue. One is the advisors themselves, and so we have a lot of central resources that that work to support them in their own um, business development. We also have a centralized marketing channel by which we do direct marketing out to prospects we nurture those prospects into interest you know where they have interest to to spend the time to meet with an advisor and we, we do that in a central basis um, and then we also participate in a number of referral programs both the traditional custodial referral programs but also um, our own referral programs that we, we've developed within that and so we they're you know a really important part of our project or what we're trying to do is we want to make sure that you know when we bring a firm in it isn't just isn't just, oh, we're, we're trying to, you know, the story of growth is just about that acquisition. We, we want to make sure that the firm coming in is excited about continuing to grow, excited about using some of the different, you know, channels we have to help drive that growth um, going forward uh, within that. And, and so why, you know, why do we shift? Well, sometimes we say, okay, well, we've got a capacity need in a specific marketplace. And so you might see us do a slightly smaller acquisition there. And that's really coming down to that. We have, you know, we have some excess uh, demand and we want to make sure we're matching up that demand with, with some really great service capacity from an advisor coming in within that. So you'll see us, you know, I would say our M&A strategy is multi-pronged um, in terms of sometimes it's really related to that engine that we're doing and we have just geographic mismatch um, within it. And so we're working through to to make sure we support that capacity. Then you also will see us in doing larger scale um, transactions as well. Yeah, interesting. Any any thoughts about um, bringing in uh, or, or acquiring firms or partnering with uh, uh, firms for a service set uh, that maybe you don't have or don't have enough of inside Wealth Enhancement Group? Here are a lot of uh, advisory firms who you know feel this need to expand the the table of services, the, the menu of services that they offer clients, bringing in things like, you know, trust and estate planning or tax preparation or whatever it might be. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, and that was definitely, a, you know, it was definitely a phase of our acquisition strategy over the years. We probably were in that phase fairly strongly, kind of 19, 20, 21. Uh, we brought in we brought a number of different firms at that time. One, one was a, a South, had a South Dakota trust. So that's become an important part of our business. Uh, we have another business that offered services specifically into um, benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and again, it wasn't, you know, our, our, our core value to our clients, our core value proposition to our, to our end clients is starts from financial planning and then extends into execution of wealth management services. And so we, 
that those acquisitions were brought in and and done to supplement that execution side um, within it and, and to expand out our key capabilities. Today, do we look so much at that? You know, we have a couple sort of tactical areas. I would say we're looking a little bit more at segmentation um, today than we are looking at sort of services. Um, we have some interest in in firms that that might be in a different sort of segment. You know, our, our you know we we haven't really played in the sort of ultra ultra high net worth space. So we we have we have some interest in looking at that. It's not a it's not a you know it's not an incredible it's not a we have to do now. It's not an imperative, but it's definitely a space to think about as we grow as a platform. Are we covering the whole range of segments um, within it? Our Edge West is designed to provide solutions for the most complex pay, personnel, and growth challenges that RA leaders grapple with every single day. The event will start on October 7th with a new Tech for Growth Summit that will help elite advisors leverage technology to unlock business growth and create scalable, repeatable, yet personalized experiences for your clients. Join us October 7th through 9th in California. For more information or to register, visit informaconnect.com slash RA Edge West. Sure. No, I mean, the, um, the service expansion is is very real. How easy though, and I think a lot of our is maybe get tripped up a little bit in you know bringing in a new service like the the head of South Dakota Trust as you mentioned, or others, and and mimicking the uh, service offering throughout the rest of the organization uh, nationally or at least super regionally or however you want to define it. Do you guys have a, a thought or process around how that's done? It's not just simply, oh, great, we have someone else we can send some emails to when a client request comes along. But, I mean, is there a uh, a kind of a, a process by which uh, service expansion happens inside Wealth Enhancement Group? Yeah, it's, you know, it's it's you're hitting on a really difficult part for these, you know, for all these firms. And so we, you know, I think it takes a couple of things. One is, you know, I, I, one of our core values is clarity. And I would tell you that it's something that we work at every day. So you bring in, you know, you bring in these different firms and suddenly now they have a number of different services they can tap into, but like, how do I tap into it? What is there, right? The clarity around that is tough and it's continually, you know, and, and not, not only is it tough to step the first time, but then, you know, the services we offer evolve because there's new services that might be needed. You know, it's a dynamic sort of component and, and you do that within a distributed model. And so, so the way that we think about it, so our core value proposition you know, if you think about there's there's three core value propositions, and this goes back. You know, I'm going to date myself. Sorry, David, but you know, there's this there's this uh, fairly you know well accepted sort of concept of what are the three core you know value propositions, and it's you know it's product leadership, there's mass customization, there's customer intimacy, and you know we are absolutely in a customer intimate model, right? We our clients come to us, they share their stories that they might share with their therapist. You know, but but probably not a lot of other people, right? Because when it comes to the money and then it's related to relationships in their lives and and struggles and issues and positives that they have in those and how can we help them with that? And, you know, it's a really, I mean, I always say it's an honor to be invited into that discussion with them. And then, you know, the, the question is, you know, how do we do that? And and so if you're in a customer intimate model, the enemy of customer intimate model is expense. It's an expensive model. And so at a, at our, our value proposition, as we say, customer intimacy is two part. One is from a central perspective, we use scale to create all those services and access for our, for our advisor teams to access it in an efficient way, because that's the way you deal with, with the enemy of customer intimacy is cost. And so that it also gives them the room because they are really the point of, of that final yard of customer intimacy and or customization ultimately to that, to that client. And so... You know, we think, I will tell you, it is a continual core activity of ours to think about how can we make our central services um, uh, more efficient in the ultimate deliver of value to our clients? How can we make them more accessible to our advisors so they can curate the right solutions for the clients? And how can we continue to make sure that we're, we're adding or having the right sort of product set of services within that? We invite you to join us on May 13th through 16th in Hollywood, Florida, for RA Edge, part of the Wealth Management Edge event. With an agenda designed to help accelerate the growth of your RA firm with the latest C-suite strategies, you'll walk away with frameworks and approaches for M&A, organic growth, and talent development. Use promo code PODCAST20 to save 20% on your registration. 
Visit wealthmanagementedge-event.com for more information. Yeah, I mean, firms get to a certain point where it's uh, the 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 advisors that work for you kind of become your your clients in a way, right? I mean, uh, uh, essential service was you know working for them in a sense and, and making things easier for them. Uh, but it sounds like a technology issue as well. Uh, yeah. Can you just uh, maybe speak a little bit about where you are in a technology evolution or or how you're you're thinking about it? Yeah. So I, I, there's, there's there's two parts to it. One is you know one of the things that I would say, you know, we've done in the, over the last 18 months is we've been invested strongly in what I would call a chronic leadership group. We brought in um, a couple of people from the industry, um, more, much larger organizations who have really been in a product management role. That's the way you drive clarity because if you don't have the clarity, you can't access technology, right? So, so first, yeah, be really clear about the services, how you offer it, how you access it, and what is it all defined. And, you know, essentially that's what we call process maturity, Right, which for for a lot of people in the industry is what makes their you know that sort of that that sounds boring, um, for sure. But it's that core inner working there that then sets you up to access technology. And so, we have for a long time um, utilized you know effectively used utilized Salesforce as our you know it's this, I'm a manufacturing guy by background um, prior to this industry, and we use it as our ERP. Right, it's the way that if you have a if you have a need, it gets, you know, you, you basically, there's a work stream, you add, you enter the need, we then have tracking for it. So we have cases, we know how old that case is. We're, we're tracking how that resolution is going, right? Because you, you said it exactly. The advisor teams, all, all the members of those teams are our internal clients. And so we have to be accountable to them, right? Which is, okay, you've submitted this and we promise to get it back to you at this time. Otherwise we can't be a, a, a an entire team, right? Because there's no accountability there. And so... We are deeply sort of utilizing Salesforce, you know, not only, you know, not as a CRM, CRM, but as a way that we can access that value proposition, which is tap into the central resource, know what's happening, know that it's being tracked, and know that it comes back to you after you put that 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 word. It could be for trust services, it could be for tax services, it could be for you know investment, it could be for you know any of a number of things uh, within that. Yeah. Do you do you all have a, a thinking around? Uh, the you know, ratio of uh, advisor out in the field to back office employee, and I ask this because I know uh, the the war for talent is something that seems to bedevil all RIAs, you know, particularly uh, uh, you know home office administrative staff, right? You know, do you have some thinking about how you fill those roles or how you structure the the home office, for lack of a better word, uh, compared to the number of advisors uh, that are out facing clients? Yeah, so we so so we we build staffing models and there are there are two drivers of staffing models one is client you know so what's the number of clients and then the other is what's the number of advisor teams and more specifically you know members of those advisor teams and it just depends what we're doing from a centralized perspective and, and the reason why i get staffing models is, is that you know then it's not a you know from a hiring perspective it's not like oh we always have to approve hiring we just say well we we know that we need you know one person in um, we need, we need one person in our IT health desk per hundred people, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the way that we can maintain the service levels that we want to maintain. And, you know, we have that and we have our central planning organization that does planning work for teams. We know that, you know, we, we measure their capacity and once they get to 70% utilization, we are then out looking for more, you know, we're out searching for more people, um, to bring in and to expand capacity. And so, you know, you really... You're going to be in a high growth organization, whether it's whether it's organic or inorganic. You have to really be thinking about staffing models because <clears throat> otherwise, you get into decisions like this person's asking for an employee or that employee, and and it, you don't have any context for it. We look at and say first, we want to have this quality of service, and in order to maintain that quality of service, we need to have this type of you know this many people within it, and and you just you know that's the way you can forecast it going into the into the into sort of growth and not have a lot of internal machinations around, you know, should we add or should we not add? It's just, no, nope, that's the staffing model. We won't have a discussion about the staffing model itself. We can do that, but it's not. In yeah. You know, that, that's, it sounds perfectly reasonable. Uh, I would wager probably a lot of RAs don't operate that way. And, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if you can maybe reflect a little bit on, you know, when you're uh, starting out there at a, a $600 million firm and growing to a $80 billion firm, Mm -hmm. At what stage do those staffing models and those processes and real kind of data-driven management decisions really take 
place? I mean, where, you know, at what, at what stage do those really lodge themselves in as being necessary for to getting the RA to the next level? I mean, could you have yeah. done things by the seat of your pants, so to speak, for the first two billion and, and <laughs> had, so whatever it might be? Yeah, I, you know, I think so. I have a bias and move to that fairly quickly. You know, I, I worked for General Mills. You know, that's manufacturer of food products. So you can imagine the standards are quite, you know, what they call it, they're gold, you know, SOI standards of identity around a product are, are pretty tight. And then went to a, a manufacturing a company that manufactured water filtration. And it was a company that we eventually built and sold the Procter and Gamble. And so also, you know, again, fairly tight, tight uh, standards of identity, right, for QC and regulatory reasons. So I always have a bias towards that because, you know, one of the things is that, as one of my advisors once said to me, clarity is energy, right? So when you have great process definition, you know, people then know how to do their job. So, and, and they're just so much, first of all, they're happier when they know exactly, you know, they know the work they're doing is the right work. And it, it just is more rewarding, which is a positive cultural perspective. And, they, and they're also significantly more productive. So, so, you know, my bias is do it early. Then the question is, well, how broad? And so we, we, from the very beginning, were, were, you know, we were a financial planning firm first and foremost. And so I can tell you, I mean, I think I had been at the firm for about a month and we had a central planning organization that was doing great work, but it was, it had high turnover and it just, it, people were dissatisfied. And so we sat down and we, you know, I think for the first quarter that I was there, develop, I said, we're going to develop standards of identity, which of course everyone looked at me and said, what is that? <laughs> But, you know, we want to make sure that you're, you know, you're servicing our internal clients, which is the advisors, and they're asking you to do this work. We want to make sure that everybody has clarity as to how to request it and what, what their expectations should be um, within that. And then from that, um, we immediately started tracking how long does it take us to do this? I mean, we had, we, you know, we, we know down to like how many minutes it takes us to do certain types of planning activities. And I would say today, even today, it's our most sophisticated staffing model that we have. Um, and in turn, that allows us actually to modularize it to our advisors. And they can go in and say, I want this, I want this, I want that. And they'll know exactly what they're going to get. And, and we know exactly how much time it will take us. Now, can you do that everywhere? And, and the answer is no, even as a, but, a, but as a small RA, you can decide this is the thing that this is our core place of value to our clients. And it, and it, it's just maybe just one piece. So you just start there, right? Mm -hmm. Because if that's your core value, then you want to be better at that than anybody else. And the way to maintain that is by having great clarity within that area. And you just, you just keep it narrow. You do it in one spot. And, you know, it's aligned with your sort of strategic, you know, your core strategic value to your clients. And, and either your clients, you know, central stakeholders, or maybe your clients or maybe your employees. Um, and then you, and, and that helps you excel in that area. And, you know, it's amazing. There's this book called Zap. It's a really old book. But it, it actually start, it starts to become a little bit contagious within the organization, right? Because open uh, the other areas start to see this one area really function. Typically, the satisfaction within that area goes up, and other areas kind of see it, and and they'll start mimicking parts of it, right? They may not go as it is in depth, but they'll they'll just start to kind of you know I don't, I don't know if infect is the right word, but the sort of sort of it just becomes contagious within the organization, within that. So you don't have to overhaul the whole place; just kind of pick that one. That one core differentiator for yourself. Good advice. What was the name of that book? Zap? Z-A-P? Zap. It's a really old book. I mean, it, 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 I think it predates my business career, but it's just, it's, and it's, it's just kind of like this little novel, you know, very short story novel type thing. And it's just about this area where they start to just one area, one component of the company, this, this sort of mythical company starts doing this kind of work and it just sort of become contagious to everywhere else around it so it's really old it's a really simple read but it's powerful in its message yeah it's got some uh, uh, kernel of wisdom in there can i speak a little bit about uh, the one of the other things that we've seen happen in the past few years uh well more than that now but private equity funds and outside investors coming into the space i know you're you're backed by uh, uh ta associates and, and onyx i believe and yeah. and most recently stone point capital i think made a an investment so there's when when private equity started coming into the space, outside investors started coming into the space, everyone predicted that it was going to be the end of the RA model because uh, those people have a different agenda than what the advisor has. Uh, and can those two agendas live under the same roof together? You seem to be making it work there. Can you reflect a little bit on your relationship with your private equity investors and, and how that works and, and how they're looking at you and how you look at them? 
Yeah. I think, well, the first thing I would say is not all PE firms are the same. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important for, for, for sellers to understand both, both, you know, if they're looking to sell their business to a PE firm, mm -hmm. or if they're looking to join a firm that's PE back. And so, you know, you know, what do I mean by that? Well, um, first of all, there's, you know, some, some PE firms have done really quite well by financial engineering. Some PE firms have done really well by growth. Um, you know, they, they have, you know, they have footprints, right? They, they've got, you know, typically if they're a more mature um, PE firm, you know, they have a footprint of the type of ways that they have, have helped support and build companies. So I think that's really critical. The other part to really assess is make sure you get, make sure you understand Make sure you get a chance to talk to other management teams, both that are that are in the current portfolio, but also have have exited that firm, because you know again it's sort of what's the, what's the way that the PE firm works with the managing team that that matters a lot um, in terms of where it might be. I, I've been blessed. I, I I'm you know we started off. Um, I mean, there was a couple things I do. So you know we our first pe transaction was 2007 and we joined, uh, we had a firm called norwest equity partners i happen to have known them I and mean, we did a you know you typically do a process where you hire a banker and but i i knew them before the process started and um in every case i've known the pe partners for at least probably 3 years before uh we had a transaction occur and i think that that's been really helpful because i was able to looked at a group of people who were interested in our company, I was able to look and say, look, these, these few here, they're, they're the better partners for us. Um, and so I think that, you know, is, is PE, I don't think PE is the death of the RA space. Mm -hmm. Um, that said, if it's your own individual company, I do think on a one by one basis it does matter. Right. And, and I think it takes time to really, um, make sure you find the right, the right partner that's aligned with your vision and your goals. And, and not only do they say it, but you can see it demonstrated in, in their footprint from the previous sort of types of transactions that they have done in other spaces and things like that. Um, my partners, you know, look, they, they are committed to quality first. Like that's, that's for me, that's the key thing that I look for is do they, do they, A, do they buy into our value proposition? Do they understand and buy into it? And then what are their value systems? And I've been blessed with partners who consistently all the way through have said, build quality first and foremost, you know, that that's, that's the core value, regardless of what happens in the world, that will always be the strength to have our value. And I'll, I'll share a story. Norwest equity partners was our first key firm. They, they invested on October 31st, 2007, which was the eve of, of GFC. And, you know, it's probably nine months later. And I was having a call with one of the partners and, you know, it was, it was a little tough, right? I mean, the, the word of the year, I think was subprime, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And things were painful. And I, and I said, you know, I was looking at sort of how to think about, you know, our budgeting, our forecast and all that stuff. And his comment was very clear to me. He said, you know what, this is a great time not buying talent, invest in the business, build, build a great business. And not all P firms would have said that at the time. But, but it was a message that didn't surprise me because I knew who they were and I knew where their commitments, you know, they've been in the PE space for 40 years um, and they've consistently built high quality firms or been part, you know, at least part of those sharing with the management team and doing that. And I think, so again, I just, I would reiterate, you know, if you're selling to a PE firm or you're going to join a firm that's PE backed is understand, you know, understand who the, who that partner is. Yeah. I mean, it probably didn't look like it at the time, but uh and at the great financial crisis, a lot of the financial planning centric firms uh, actually did pretty well, came out of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. I mean, it was, it was, you know, they, his response to me was, you know, foot on the gas pedal. Um, and then similar, you know, you can go into, you know, I can say the same thing about TA with COVID. You know, we, you know, it was, we, we, uh, you know, obviously all firms are getting together and, and TA was a great partner. And they, they, you know, they said, look, we're executing in all the right ways. Let's lean into what we're doing. Let's lean in and double down on our strategy. And, you know, it paid off. And those are the kind of, you, you, you only figure, you only truly know those things when you're at those moments, but you want to try to understand, you know, what, what the, the specific firm, what has been there, what has been their footprint and what, how have they sort of acted if you can figure that out, because that will at least help you predict, you know, predict how they might act in a moment that you can't actually know exactly what it might look like. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I know we're coming up against a, a, the end of our time here. 
I'm getting the, the pings from the producer, but uh, let me uh, I just ask you one more quick thing. Um, if, talk to me a little bit about the, the organic growth strategy. I mean, the, the other side of this coin, you know, there's some thoughts out there that, you know, organic growth actually is uh, overall for the RA industry, non-existent. You know, if it weren't for the, the ever rising markets, uh, there'd be no growth at many RA firms at all. That is what some people say. How important is organic growth to your strategy? And if someone had to say to you, you can do one of two things uh, from now until the, the end of uh, your professional career, and it's either focus on M&A or focus on organic growth, which of those two would you take? Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, well, can I answer the first part? And that'll let me think about how to, how to make that choice. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would tell you that organic growth is the core engine of our business. And, you know, we... We started off as an organic growth engine. It was I was a consumer marketer by background. What attracted me about this firm is that they had a very strong marketing approach um, to developing and systematic approach to developing prospects and nurturing them into clients. So, I you know I believe that that is critical to this in- industry. We you know we see a lot of firms, and I would I I, I do I would say that <clears throat> that you know net flows are under stress for most firms. We, and part of our proposition is come join us and we will support you in that growth. And we, we typically, you know, after they get through the transition, we see about two to 400 basis point improvement in their net flows. Mm-hmm. Overall as a firm, um, our net flows are, you know, tracking right, right around about 7% this year. Our, our long range target as we look forward is we are always striving to be between eight and 10% net flows. And, you know, I, I think that, right, so if I had to pick, you know, you've really forced me against it. I mean, right now there's a huge premium on scale and growing, and that's what's really fueling the M&A side. But if I had to pick, I would be on organic growth committed because, you know, the merry-go-round of M&A in, in every industry, it stops. Eventually it stops. And then you really find out which firms are real firms. And, you know, my... You know, my, my passion here, obviously, you know, you're driven by lots of reasons, motivations, but my passion is to develop a great company. And I believe that, you know, that starts by, by a company that can sustain its growth, um, for time. You know, if you ask me, how big do you want to be? Right. And I'm like, well, nobody asked that of Schwab or Fidelity. I mean, they want to keep growing. And so my desire, it gets back to the first part of the way you introed today, which is my desire is to create a great company that has sustainable growth. And the only way you can do that is through organic growth. That's great. I, Jeff, I could keep uh, asking questions all day long, uh, but I know we're running out of time here. So uh, I'm going to let you go and I hope that we can do it again and continue the conversation. That would be great. David, I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for listening. This has been the RA Edge podcast. 